Well, great to be back with you. We are obviously making a day of firsts today. Um, it is traditional for the RTS Cambridge Convention to be addressed by the DCMS Secretary of State. So I am delighted that Oliver Dowden had agreed to talk to us this evening. However, as many of you will now have read, he's rather busy over at CCHQ right now. As we've also just heard from a member of the audience, uh, Nadine Dorries has been appointed Secretary of State, and I'm sure as chair, you would all appreciate and join me in welcoming her to the role. And I think also it's appropriate for us, or for me to at least, put on record our thanks and my thanks to her predecessor for the work that he has done throughout the pandemic, pushing forward a positive agenda for the creative industries, and in particular, those in, uh, in employment beyond the bigger players. I am delighted, however, as was earlier trailed, that we have John Whittingdale, the current Minister of State for Media and Data, who can join us. John, of course, is an old friend of the RTS, and so we're glad that he's been able to step in at the last minute. Unfortunately, for obvious reasons, he's unable to be here in person, but I'm delighted that he's able to join us by VC. So please join me in welcoming him virtually to the conference. Um, thank you very much. It, it's a pleasure to be speaking to the RTS at Cambridge once again. Um, the last time I addressed you, I was introduced uh, with a VT by status quo, which is, is still one of my, my treasured possessions. But it, I hadn't quite expected to be back either in uh, this capacity or quite uh, in these circumstances. Uh, but it is uh, a pleasure. Um, I should make clear, as you, you will have gathered, that the speech I'm about to deliver is the speech that was uh, written, and certainly it was the intention of uh, Oliver Dowden to give. Uh, but it is very much the speech of the Secretary of State, uh, and I'm looking forward to working with Nadine, who, as you have heard, has just been appointed this afternoon. So, uh, despite everything we've been through with COVID, the British screen industry is, in fact, booming. The people behind the biggest and most exciting productions Bond, the new Lord of the Rings, have their pick of any country in the world to make their films and TV shows. And yet they are choosing to make them here. Studios up and down the country are running at full capacity. New ones are opening up all the time, from Broxbourne to Birmingham and from Edinburgh to Elstree. The nation united as a global production powerhouse. This hasn't happened by accident. The government has worked intensively with you to create this record-breaking environment for our screen industries. From quarantine exemptions to tax breaks, to our global screen fund, and to our UK-wide 500 million pound film and TV restart scheme, which has kept cameras rolling on productions across the country throughout the pandemic. That scheme has kept up momentum during COVID and helped secure hundreds of thousands of high quality jobs in film, TV, and the wider broadcasting system. Politicians always talk about job numbers, but these aren't just jobs. The screen industry is generating meaningful, creatively fulfilling jobs, jobs that I'd want to do, and that I'd want my children and grandchildren to do. And the productions that these people work on have an impact all over the world. His dark materials, Dracula, Unforgotten, last year's biggest TV exports have been viewed in hundreds of territories from China to Brazil, to Australia, to South Korea. Or to take another example, Sex Education, filmed in Newport and the most popular show in Saudi Arabia. Of course, we celebrate this. But it doesn't address the central theme of this conference, which is Britishness. Britishness is, of course, a nebulous concept. It means different things to each and every one of us in the room. And yet we all know it when we see it on our screens. 
the sort of things we've all grown up with. Only Fools and Horses, Dad's Army, Carry On, and more recently, The Great British Bake Off, Line of Duty, and of course, Coronation Street and EastEnders. In fact, who we are has been defined by television. At the same time, film, television, and radio are by far the most powerful tools we have to project the best of modern Britain to the rest of the world. Not just to show off our creativity, and there's no doubt that this country is home to some of the most gifted, creative talent in the world, but to broadcast our values and our unique identity across the planet. So as the government looks at the future of broadcasting in this country, we intend to use our upcoming white paper to preserve what is special about British broadcasting. First, we want to make sure that British made content is in fact distinctively British. Now I'm not talking about waving union flags and a picture of the queen in every scene. I'm talking about continuing to make the programs that are ours and only ours, that could only have been made in the United Kingdom. Take Derry Girls, a show that addresses the troubles and the rise and fall of Take That with equal passion. It could only have been made here. Likewise, what other country in the world would have come up with a concept as bonkers but as brilliant as Gogglebox? Fleabag isn't Fleabag without its British sarcasm and its self-deprecation. And the last episode of Blackadder Goes Forth, when the squadron goes over the top, would never have been as poignant without that classically British dash of restraint. Contrast that with some of the programmes you can get on demand today. They can be brilliantly entertaining, but many of them have no real identity, no genuine sense of place. Some of them look like they've been cleverly generated by a streaming algorithm to maximise their target audience globally. Keeping the British spirit and identity alive is a challenge in today's global broadcasting world when investment is increasingly driven by global streaming services. Our public service broadcasters now get more money for drama from foreign investors than they spend themselves. That investment is extremely welcome. In fact, it's absolutely crucial to their survival. But we want to make sure that it doesn't water down British creativity or the British brand. Our public service broadcasters have a unique role to play in that context. And the government wants to empower them to keep making things that are just as unique and distinctively ours, no matter where the money is coming from. To continue producing shows that aren't just authentic and relevant to British audiences, ones that allow people in every corner of the UK to see themselves and their own way of life reflected on their screens, but also to showcase the things that we are most proud of to the rest of the world, to make things that are iconic, not generic. So in our upcoming white paper, we intend to include proposals that will expand the remit of public service broadcasters so that it, it includes a requirement for them to produce distinctively British content. If it's set in Britain and made in Britain by our public service broadcasters, then it should be distinctively British. At the same time, we want to ensure that British broadcasters get the exposure that they deserve, no matter how their content is consumed. Public service broadcasters have been part of our national life for almost a century, and they are uniquely placed to reflect our values. In a world of fake news and disinformation, they're a trusted source of content and information, and they play a crucial role in bringing the nation together in times of crisis and celebration, whether it's a national COVID press conference or a royal wedding. So it's incredibly important that they keep their place at the heart of television. That's why we plan to legislate as soon as possible and make it a legal requirement that major online platforms must carry PSB content and that they must ensure that it's easy to find. To support the future sustainability 
of public service Broadcom, uh, broadcasting, Ofcom will also be given new powers to support effective commercial negotiations with platforms. That is one way of making sure our British broadcasters thrive. Another is putting them in the right financial position to compete and succeed for decades to come, no matter what the future of broadcasting holds. As you'll all no doubt be aware, indeed, I've just been listening to Alex before me, this summer, we launched a consultation to consider the ownership of Channel 4. That consultation closed yesterday. And the government's position is that a change of ownership could be beneficial for Channel 4 and beneficial for the country. Let me be clear, Channel 4 is one of this country's great assets. It was created by a Conservative Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, to open up the market, to boost the independent production sector, and to give viewers more choice when they turned on their sets. It has succeeded in that mission in the four days a decade since, and it has managed to withstand an incredible amount of turbulence in the last few years, from streaming to COVID. Right now, Channel 4 is in a stable position. But too many people are fixated on Channel 4's current situation. The government is more concerned with its long-term future. We believe that if Channel 4 wants to grow, and as Alex has set out, it both wants and needs to grow, then at some point soon, it will need cash. Without it, Channel 4 won't have the money to invest in technology, and programming, and it won't be able to compete with the streaming giants. So the next obvious question is where does that cash come from? It can either be on the back of the taxpayer or it can come from private investment. And it's our strong position as a point of principle that the borrowing of a commercial TV channel should not be underwritten by a granny in Stockport or in South End. Instead, we can help it unlock that much needed investment. And we can do so while protecting the parts of Channel 4 that none of us want to lose. So if we do choose to proceed with a sale, we will make sure that Channel 4 remains subject to proper public service obligations. And I'd imagine that those are bound to include a continued commitment to independent news and current affairs, to commissioning programming from the independent production sector, and that Channel 4 should continue to be representative of the entire nation. Let me be clear, the government does not subscribe to the false binary choice between public service content and privatization. We can have both. Channel 4 can continue to do what it does best to fund original risk-taking content, the kind you don't find anywhere else and to showcase the very best of this country on free to view television. It did do a great job of broadcasting the Paralympics. And we want it to keep doing that fantastic job in another three years time and the years after that. And I was delighted that Channel 4 was able to bring the entire country together on Saturday night to cheer on Emma Raducanu in the US Open final. We've needed those national moments this last year and we need more of them on free to view. A Channel 4 with a protected remit and deeper pockets could bring us many, many more in the future. And we're acutely conscious of avoiding a repeat of Project Kangaroo when Channel 4, ITV and BBC Worldwide were blocked by the Competition Commission from launching an online platform that could have led the market and set them all up for years of growth. By presuming that we didn't have to change, by sticking with what we knew, rather than thinking creatively, we stymied the opportunity to create a homegrown alternative to Netflix. A decade later, this government is determined we don't miss the opportunity to equip, equip British broadcasting for the next decade. And if people disagree, then the challenge to them is please tell us how they'd intend to protect Channel 4 and the wider creative industries in a fair and more sustainable way. Because standing still is not an option. In fact, it would be an act of self-harm. I want to make one final point, and it's an important one. Whatever happens, whatever decision is taken with Channel 4, 
There is no way this government will ever compromise our independent production industry. As I said at the beginning, UK film and TV is booming. Hundreds of thousands of people, thousands of families rely on that industry for, for their living, for their creative fulfillment, for their sense of self. Our economy relies on our creative industries, no less than our national identity relies upon it. We will do everything we can to protect it in the years ahead. That is the job of government, to think not just about today, but about tomorrow too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you very much for stepping in at the, at the last minute. If, you, if I can get you to look at the camera, rather than, I think you've got me on a screen to the side. There you go, perfect. You're much better when we get a full, full uh, straight on view. Thank you very much. Um, I understand that we've only got time for three quick questions. Is that, is that right? Yep, far away, and we'll see how we get, we get on. Excellent. I can, I can hear the audience already thinking up a fourth and a fifth for me, so um, <laughs> that, 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 that's great. Um, in terms of the future of regulation, the whole conference has obviously been talking about the Channel 4 question. And you, in, in that speech, referred to Channel 4 as one of the, the country's greatest assets. Earlier in this session, you will have heard Alex, um, its, its CEO, say, uh, as far as she was concerned, there was no evidence that a privately owned Channel 4 would be better able to fulfill its obligations and its remit. She makes clear that that's the, her belief. How do you address that response to your government's position? Well, the government hasn't reached a decision. The government has an open mind. That's why we're having a consultation. But where I think uh, we are concerned is that Channel 4, uniquely amongst the um, public service broadcasters, is completely dependent on a single source of revenue, which is advertising. And you know, as more and more content becomes available, as choice becomes greater with streaming services setting up in the UK when I'm almost on a sort of monthly basis, then the competition for eyeballs is just going to increase. Um, and the pressure on advertising revenue is going to increase. And Channel 4 doesn't have recourse elsewhere. As I said in the, uh, in the speech, um, you know, the, the, the source of revenue, of, of, of investment capital at the moment is very limited because Channel 4 is not able to borrow and it's not able to call upon uh, the resources of an owner in the way that, for instance, Channel 5 can now do as part of their uh, ownership by Viacom. So it's really in the longer term that we are concerned that the pressure on Channel 4 is going to steadily increase. Uh, and we feel, feel that it is right to examine, therefore, what needs to be done to sustain Channel 4 in the long term, and that it is best to do that now rather than wait for the crisis to happen. And, and one other thing that she, she, she also said, which is a slightly different challenge to the private versus public debate, was she argued that a lot of the diverse content, a lot of Channel 4's diverse content would simply not be on screen were it a privately held and, and profit-oriented organization. Well, I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, the first thing to say is that you know, if, if if the government does decide to go ahead with the change of ownership, it is not on the basis that we need to raise some money. It is about sustaining Channel 4 and Channel 4's remit, its unique remit in delivering very different content, in appealing to minority audiences, in being a sort of risky, um, edgy broadcaster. In a way, that is part of the attraction of Channel 4. I don't believe that anybody is going to want to acquire Channel 4 and then throw away the thing which it is most uh, is most successful at winning audiences. So, I mean, I think the Channel 4 brand is something that, firstly, any change of ownership, um, any acquirer would want to preserve. But secondly, of course, we will be um, ensuring that the remit of Channel 4 continues. Um, and in some cases, we may even enhance or strengthen it. So, you know, there is no question that in our mind, Channel 4 needs to continue to make the kind of programming which it's been so successful at uh, in the last 40 years. And we will, you know, we will be putting in place measures to ensure that it does. Excellent. I'm going to switch tack just slightly because Britishness is a big theme 
here at the, at the convention over the next couple of days. And so I was delighted that you spoke about the public service remit encouraging distinctively British shows that are, I think you said, iconic and not generic. But I guess a question for those who are program makers or program commissioners in the room, what in reality will that mean for the program makers and content commissioners in the sector? Well, I mean, it, it is a difficult concept to measure. Um, you know, I mean, we, we impose obligations on the PSBs in terms of things like the proportion of their commissioned hours that which are placed with production companies outside London or whatever. That's something which you know is very easy to, to sit down and, and uh, calculate. Um, the remit requirement, which is more subjective, and, and Channel 4 is a good example of one that does have a, a much more subjective remit in terms of sort of having to make distinctive programming or edgy programming. Britishness, again, is, it's quite hard to quantify, but you know, that's something we will talk to Ofcom about um, as to how precisely a obligation will work. But I think you know, Britishness is something which is easily recognisable. And to some extent, it's about who programmes are aimed at and the job of the public service broadcasters is to produce programming which appeal to British audiences. If we can sell them around the world, then that's fantastic. But the first and primary audience needs to continue to be Britain. And another question just to follow up on that Britishness. Beyond yeah. the content itself, how do you think Britishness can be better reflected in our creative industries and specifically within the television sector, both on and off screen? What more would you and the government like to see being done? Well, obviously, we're very keen that um, the television, but the, the broadcasters themselves sort of get out of London, that they uh, establish um, production centres across the UK. Um, you know, Channel 4 has done this, BBC has done this, but there is more that can be done. Um, and we're also very keen to ensure that you know, the production companies, the indie sector, um, is, is utilised right across all of the nations and the regions of the UK. Those are the kinds of things that we can um, place as part of the public service remit obligations. But there's also television content. Um, and again, people who live in, in the north of England or in Northern Ireland or in Scotland expect to see programming which reflects their lives. One or two of the programmes I mentioned, you know, Derry Girls is an extraordinarily successful programme because it is very clearly set in, the, in Northern Ireland at a particularly challenging time for Northern Ireland, but is immensely creative. Um, and it's that kind of success at reflecting all the parts of the UK, not just the sort of metropolitan centres or the southeast of England, which we're extremely keen to continue to see on our screens and to have to increase uh, to increase the amount. Excellent. I think that's very good. I'm going to ask one more question, and then if you have a moment, I'm going to ask them to raise the lights. So please ready yourselves, and maybe we'll take, be able to take one or two from the floor if that's acceptable. Great. I'll ask a somewhat, hopefully, not too self-serving question, but you mentioned in your speech uh, your plans to set out, plans to legislate as soon as possible to ensure that PSB content inclu was included on and discoverable across major online platforms. How do you kind of define that, and, and when do you think we might begin to see some of those details? Well, I mean, Ofcom has been very active in... Um, drawing up the detail of how the prominence requirements will work. Um, and obviously, there's still some work to do, but in the um, public service uh, broadcasting uh, study that Ofcom has already conducted, they are producing recommendations, uh, and that will in due course require legislation. Um, so we will be producing a white paper later this year, which will set out our proposals for reforming the law, but we will then await a uh, a bill, a media bill, which is, I hope, going to come uh, in the next session of Parliament, which will be next year. And do you think there'll be any delay to the pr plans and proposals around the media bill just as, as a dint of the, the reshuffle? Well, I mean, the, 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 you know, the government um, continues to work. I mean, I, I, I've sat behind the Secretary of State's chair, as you know, uh, in the past, and I think there have now been either six or seven Secretaries of State since I was there. Um, so, you know, the personalities change, but the firstly, you know, the government's policies um, 
are not dependent on an individual, they're collectively agreed. And secondly, the challenges that we're seeking to face are the, what are driving the policy, not the personality of who happens to be taking the policy decisions. Perfect. Do we have microphones? And if we have questions, there's a, there's a gentleman down the front here that I see with his hands up. And others, please, if we get a second question. Uh, hello, John. John McVeigh from PACT. <clears throat> nice to see you, and thanks for stepping into the breach. Um, <clears throat> and also thanks for your, uh, or Oliver's, uh, eloquent support for the independent production sector. It warmed the cockles of my heart. But I've, I've got, I'm trying to square a circle here. You, you were involved in setting up Channel 4, the single biggest intervention to generate a whole generation of entrepreneurs, self-starters, independent production companies, disruptors, innovators, and creatives. Um, and it, it's been 40 years, and, and Alex has spoke very well about how that's helped to build the sector and indeed other interventions. However, our own research, so this, you know, as a good conservative, you did an amazing job setting up Channel 4. But here we are with a conservative government, which is looking to transfer £3.7 billion worth of value over 10 years from the independent sector to whoever the new shareholder or owners of Channel 4 might be going forward if you decide to do that. And I don't know how you square that circle. I thought you supported entrepreneurship and SMEs and self-starters. So I just can't square that number with what I thought was conservative policy. Um, well, first of all, John, um, I'm not quite that old. I think I was at university when Channel 4 was set up, so I, I didn't play a major part in its creation. Um, but nevertheless, I, I was delighted. And it was the product of the time. And when Channel 4 was set up, there was a, two other broadcasters. Um, and the independent production sector, as you know, didn't exist. It was set up to provide the catalyst, which was hugely successful to grow the independent production sector. We're now at a point where some of those independent production companies, which you represent, are actually bigger than Channel 4. They certainly don't need government intervention. Um, but Channel 4, I think, still has uh, a role in uh, supporting smaller independent production companies, startups, uh, and therefore that may be one of the areas where we would seek to change the remit. But the remit will continue. Um, and therefore, you know, we will see Channel 4 continuing to commission from the independent production sector, whether or not it is allowed an in-house uh, in production facility of its own. And that's something uh, that we uh, haven't reached a decision on. It's part of the consultation. But this is about actually giving Channel 4 access to capital, which will allow it to spend more on, in, on production. Um, our concern is that you know, the finances over the longer term are going to become increasingly under pressure and that this way we can give it access to the investment which it is going to bound to need, which must be in the interests of the British independent production sector who will continue to win those commissions. We have one more question down the front and then if there's nothing else, I will let the minister go. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'm Simon Walker. I run Marquee TV, the performing arts streamer. Um, earlier today, Richard Sharp said that if the BBC didn't exist, you would not invent it today. If Channel 4 didn't exist, would you invent it today? Um, an interesting question. On the BBC, I'm a huge supporter of and want to see continue as the centrepiece of service broadcasting in this country, in state ownership, um, and certainly funded, well, we will have a debate about the best means of funded, funding at the end of the charter. Whether or not I think one would want to create a second publicly owned broadcaster, I think is more debatable, given the number of channels that are now available. Well, now, as I said, there was BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV, and that was it. Um, you know, people didn't have the choice. Today, you, you, you are so spoiled for choice. I mean, I, I love television, um, but my goodness, I'm missing a huge amount of shows that I would love to watch simply because there isn't enough time in the day. So I don't think there is the same need that existed uh, 40 years ago when Channel 4 was set up. But there is still a need for public service broadcasting. And as I've said, public service broadcasting is not the same as public ownership. 
we can deliver what we want to see through public service broadcasting, through the obligations that go with it, um, without necessarily having to own all of the broadcasters or indeed two of the broadcasters um, that are providing it. John, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for stepping into the breach at such late notice. Uh, I think we all in the room would like to uh, join me in thanking you, but also wishing you the very best of luck in the next 24 hours and whatever that may bring for, for you.